the origins of the remote viewing program is kind of interesting because a lot of myth mythology around that as well. Originally, there was a lot of uh, studies in remote viewing started in the mid-1940s in America, but it, it actually started much earlier than that with a man by the name of René Wokalye who presented 30 years of research in 1946, which was basically nothing but remote viewing that he had done with, with his daughter. Ingo Swan was tipped to the SRI research by Cleve Baxter. You remember him, he did all the research in, with plants, you know. And uh, as a result, he moved to SRI in 1972 and began working with Hal Putoff. This is long before it was called remote viewing. Ingo Swan came up with a term, and it's really a misnomer because remote viewing, you don't see anything. It's extremely rare. In 37 years of remote viewing, I've actually only seen the target maybe seven times. The rest of it is perceptions. Everything from noises, smell, touch, taste, feelings, gut reactions, that sort of thing. There were numerous entities playing with remote viewing from 72 to 78. Mostly it was the interest of the CIA. The CIA actually hired SRI to investigate its possible use for intelligence purposes. It was installed as a test program in 1978. It was called Gondola Wish. That's what its first name was. It was a three-year program. And the reason why, so in their wisdom, the Army said, well, what we'll do is we'll emulate the Russians. Since we know the Russians are using psychics, we want to know how good they are. What we'll do is we'll select some psychics of our own, but they have to have clearances. And we'll take them out of the Army counterintelligence units. And we'll teach them how to do remote viewing the way we think it should be done, but we'll call them Russian remote viewing artists. And we'll release them into the wild in America. And they can target the Pentagon and the White House and places like that for a year. And then we'll bring them back in out of the cold at the end of that year. And we'll take all of their material and turn it over to the NSA or some independent agency and have them evaluate it and tell us how good they think it was or how bad. And that will tell us how good or how bad the Russians are. And if anybody jumps on us for it, we can say, oh, no, 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 we don't believe in this stuff. We're pretending to be Russians that believe in it. Problem was, we had an incident. It's called the fall of the American embassy in Iran in November of 1979. When the embassy fell, it was on a Sunday, and they had no idea who was in the embassy and who wasn't. And if you can't tell the people who take your hostages who the hostages are, they can disappear people permanently. So they thought it's a long shot, but let's see what these guys can do. We'll just throw it to them because this is a target no one knows anything about. So we got the target, a couple of us were put in a war room with about 590 photos and asked to identify who were the specific hostages. They came up with 64 photos or 61 photos we pinned to the wall and it included three sketches done in pencil. Those were of CIA agents no one even knew were in country. They were picked up at the Foreign Affairs Office. As a result, we went from a study project only a month and a half into a three-year study to a fully operational collection unit, and it was called Grill Flame, and that was in November of 1979. President Carter gave a presentation to some news people and said, we have there's been a missing Russian bomber it vanished somewhere over Africa, and of course, everybody, for obvious reasons, has been looking for it for quite some time. And we have finally found it. This is a year and a half into looking for the bomber, uh, the aircraft. And one of the newsmen said, how did you find it? He said, we used our psychics. <laughs> and he was holding a folder in his arm, and it said, grill flame on it. So that night, everything got moved around, and we became Project Center Lane. That's how you get a name change. Now, mission example, we had Department of Energy came to us and said, can you track a spy? Obviously, they want to protect their, uh, their nuclear materials. So we said, sure, it's a piece of cake. So what they did is they gave me a three by five card with the social security number of one of their employees on it. I had no idea if this was a woman or a man or their age or anything. And what they said was they would call me at on three occasions over the course of a year and when they called me what they wanted was a description of the individual and where that individual was standing. So the first call I got actually was at midnight and I was in downtown San Francisco staying with a psychologist friend of mine. This is the drawing I did 
You can see uh, building A here is a T-shaped building with a little box on top. And I said basically the person was in the center of that building on the top floor in what they call the director's office. And I have no idea where that is. And this is the actual target. And this is the T-shaped building with the little box on top. And he was, in fact, in that room, which is the director's office. It was 1 o'clock in the morning, and, and he wasn't supposed to be there. Now, this was another one. They called me in the middle of the night, and I could not get anything straight. Um, this is a very complex target. It wasn't making any sense to me at all. I tried to draw it, and it turns out it was the accelerator at Stanford. In the very end of that, that drawing, what I said was, um, it's too complicated, I can't draw it, uh, I'm just going to simplify it for you. It's a place that accelerates electrons. This was the next drawing that I did. Um, obviously, these are some kind of power poles producing energy, and the halos are things that are moving that I can't see from a remote viewing standpoint. Uh, it's in a form of a grid, and it's producing a lot of electromagnetic energy. And this is where the person was standing. And I got a 99% figure of merit for this, because I did not give them the car and the color of the car he was in. So they said, oh, this is really good. You, you can. You can actually track a spy. Tell us where he is. But can you tell us what he's doing? And so they called me one afternoon and said, tell us what our spy is doing. And I drew this. This is some kind of an energy project projection device locked up in a box or a big, big crate or something. And that's a field. And these are electronic targets. And what he's doing is de destructive testing of electronics using some kind of an energy wave projector and it's in some kind of a box. It turns out that the angle of projection is exactly correct, and uh, this is what the actual device looks like. And what's interesting about this is this is all microwave. It's obvious to any engineer it's a microwave. That's the actual device sticking out of the back of the box, and that's the actual device. Along with this was approximately 70 minutes of tape information and a whole lot of other drawings I couldn't get declassified. But they turned this over to an independent engineering group and they drew examples of what it was and said that they could build a machine just like it and they said what the machine was and what it did and it turns out that they could replicate the machine based on my remote viewing. My training officer, Skip Atwater, would come in from the project and test me to see whether or not my remote viewing was getting any better. And one of his tests that he brought, one of the training tests that he brought, was a target that I didn't know anything about. I, normally I did mundane targets, like quasi-military targets. Well, this particular week, he brought a Mars target. I didn't know it was a Mars target. But he gave, gave a sealed envelope, neither did Bob Monroe. He gave a sealed envelope to Bob Monroe, which inside had a card that said Mars, one million years BC. So Bob had this uh, card in his shirt pocket, and we had a list of coordinates as targets. And the first set of coordinates was uh, 44.89 degrees, 9.55 degrees west. I didn't know anything about the targets as I was laying in a dark black cube in the lab floating on a sea of salt listening to hemisync tapes and the first thing I heard was the coordinates and this was my response I got a great view of a pyramid a pyramid form sitting in a large depression it's yellowish ochre colored I get clouds, a severe storm, major geological trauma. Then I was asked to visit the site before the trauma. They said, go back before the trauma. They said all the dirt had disappeared. There were now smooth walls. Everything was flat, megalithic. 
I said something about, gee, is this a new pyramid? Did they discover a new pyramid? Because it's really large. This is the actual target based on the coordinates. That's the face everybody's always referring to on Mars. This is actually the depressed area. This is the pyramid. It's actually a double layered pyramid. This is the second set of coordinates that I got. In a canyon looking up steep high walls that go on forever. Very intricate, huge sections of smooth stone carved out. Getting very large structures. Rabbit worn of huge corridors and rooms. I said the rooms were really large. And again, I said something to him about this has got to be some new pyramids or something because I don't remember ever seeing rooms this size in Giza or anywhere like that. This is Mars. This is an impact crater. What you can't see is in a really well-focused picture is as the road goes straight through that crater. The walls have been degraded on both sides to allow that road to go through there. What this is is a pyramid. It's a four-sided pyramid with a flat edge. You can measure the shadow, and if you know the angle of the sun in relation to the surface of Mars, you can guesstimate the height of the outside wall of that canyon. It's 1,500 feet. You notice the shadow down here for the pyramid? It goes off the paper. How many feet do you think that is? A whole lot more. But that's not the spooky part here. Here's the hard part to believe. That's an impact crater, so that can't be there. It would have been wiped out by whatever made that impact. The fact that it's there means it was put there after the impact. Now, I've talked to scientists about it. I'm talking about straightforward scientists who really know their business. And the best answer I've gotten so far is it's a giant crystal and it grew. It's between 7,500 and 8,500 feet in height. It had to be formed after the crater was formed. What about the future? Can you actually target the future and can you prove it? Well, in 1979, at the very outset of our project, when we were just fledglings and we really weren't sure about what we were doing, the National Security Council had a really big problem. They had this building in the north of the Soviet Union and it was the biggest building under a single roof anywhere in the world. And they've been taking car loads of, train loads of materials into this building for over a year, and the car loads were coming out empty. And they had no idea what was going on inside the building. It was uh, in the middle of nowhere. It was surrounded by triple fences, a death wire, a division of troops, guard dogs, almost every kind of defensive perimeter you could put around it. And they had no idea what was going on in there, so it was the first number one priority of the National Security Council. So uh, Admiral Jake Stewart, a one star who was working for the National Security Council, brought the target to us, and I happened to be the one next up, so I got the target. And I worked on it for about a week, and the conclusion I came to was that they were building a new kind of submarine. And the submarine had two hulls going together sideways, and it was half again larger than any other submarine in the world. And we sent that report to the National Security Council along with a huge list of all its, all its upgrades, one of which was slanted missile tubes, which meant that the, they had improved their launch capability from having to stop and launch to launching while moving. They sent it back. Uh, Robert Gates, who was the Russian off desk officer at the time, working on the National Security Council, Sent it back, and on the top he wrote, Total Fantasy, <laughs> RG. <laughs> and so when the Admiral brought it back, he said, Here, here's the response I got for you, Joe. He said, does this make you angry? And I said, yes. He said, what would you like me to do? And I wrote across it in red. I said, well, we'll launch in 112 days. I think I said, Fantasy will launch in 112 days. <laughs> J. And he, instead of taking it right back to the NSC, he took it to the NRO and arranged to be looking at that site 114 days out. So 114 days later, 
they took pictures of, of this submarine, which was launched two days prior and was sitting at the harbor with all its bay doors open, and they were loading the twin reactors with the control rods and loading all the missiles in the front bays. And we collected more intelligence on the sub, that one submarine than on the entire Soviet sub pack in history. Now, just to show you, this does not happen with just one person. I worked with another guy who came in after me. I left after six years, and right behind me, a man named Paul Smith came in. And Paul Smith, while working on another target, suddenly said, gee, you know, I see an American ship being attacked with s set missiles. That was predicted 112 days prior. The USS Stark was struck with two Exocet missiles by an Iraqi war jet, and that was four months prior. They didn't know what to do with the prediction, so they put it in a file. When 9-11 occurred, I know there are two remote viewing reports that were on file for over a year, one of which actually named one of the pilots. You don't know what to do with this material. You get psychic material, what do you do with it? How do you confirm it or deny it? Better to just ignore it. The bursting of the U.S. housing bubble peaked in 2006, caused the values of securities tied to U.S. real estate pricing to plummet, damaging financial institutions globally. It helped create the 2008 financial crisis, pretty impressive failure. I predicted it in 2006, I'm sorry, I predicted it in 1998 and put it in my ultimate time machine book. What's interesting is I got half as many people wrote me and said, great job, I put all my stuff into hard metals and it saved me. And I got half again as many that wrote me and said, gee, I wish I had believed you. I said between 1998 and 2003 that a much greater war would be fought in the Middle East. And our war with Iraq began on 20 March 2003. This is everyone's been telling me, no way, we really kicked their whatever. I predicted an even more significant war would follow this nine to 11 years. And that's the war in Afghanistan still ongoing. But what about the future? We're hovering on the precipice of World War III, and it'll come at the collapse of the Saudi Arabia sometime in the next four to five years. That's the third you prediction I make.